Uh, it's a, a big pleasure uh, to share with you some insight in, into um, uh, these issues that we have now with um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 pandemic. And it's uh, maybe interesting for you to know that um, I'm also uh, already since the beginning of the crisis, I'm linked with uh, some of your Kenyan colleagues in uh, around Lake Victoria and Siaya district and uh, uh, around in order to really go at the periphery to look at this problem of, uh, of uh, SARS-2 uh, transmission. So uh, it's uh, thank you very much again for this invitation. What I want to do with you, I want to share some of the issues that we have not only in Switzerland, uh, but actually how we can again in the spirit that I have always followed is this mutual learning for change that we can learn together when we think about, uh, in this case now, the pandemic, uh, how we can learn together in order to make a difference in global public health. I have prepared a few slides and I hope you can see the screen. I can see it, that it is shared, but otherwise you just must shout if, if you don't see it and you see me as well now. And uh, I, I would like to start with uh, some basics. I want to give you uh, the, in this, po uh, this possibility. The big question in all the countries and in the areas are always the question of which strategies and which approaches that you have to do if something un unexpected happens and how you go with all this. So I start with this picture on the strategies. These are some basic slides. You know, this is actually when everything was in full swing here, we were driving through DRC in 2005. And then suddenly in full swing, something happens. In this case, it was this snake that went over the street. And we were actually, this is an easy case. When this happens to you, you just stop and you wait until nicely the, uh, the snake is over, and then you are just admire the beautiful incident that you had the chance to see this python. Now, when it came to uh, COVID, some people actually, and particularly scientists, they just looked at it in a strategy in a different way. They looked at the strategy in this way that they would say, oh, we have a very big problem. And uh, without just let's look, let's examine, Let's do some research. Let's find out. But with this attitude, as you can agree, I mean, the, the rock, the big rock still remains and they will not move away. And you are just doing some very nice descriptions and some nice analysis. Another important thing for the strategies in such pandemic situation, but always actually, is, is this picture, is that you need to have to have the right tools. You know, this man here doesn't have the right tool to knock down the tree. So whenever we actually design strategies, sometimes very theoretically, we are actually, in, uh, we are actually uh, yeah, uh, challenged to have to also ask which are the right tools. So just keep these pictures. Then there is another strategy that many people have tried at the beginning of not only the uh, SARS situation, they have actually done this, what this penguin man does. Uh, it's do one brave thing today and then run like hell. That's what they, what they, what they sometimes do. Uh, and um, this, of course, as you can see, uh, it's, it's, it looks nice, it's attractive, but it's not the strategy that carries us forward. And if you just do one thing that you think is fine, you may endanger here the mama uh, uh, penguin, that actually when the ice bear wakes up as a serious problem. So what we are in now in the strategy discussion is actually this one, is actually that we uh, do fun and uh, have extreme sports. Fun means that we do our science with enthusiasm, not just happy life, enthusiasm committed. And we are actually targeted to what we have to solve. We protect ourselves, but actually we are very much determined to reach that. So this is one of the, uh, of the uh, uh, basics that we always have to think that we are not dropping into these strategy traps that are 
very often if the strategies are not rooted to the realities. As we, I don't have to say in Ilri, but it is something which I had, and this is not to teach you, but actually I had actually a really big problem uh, in, uh, in, in some other context to actually show people that this whole issue of emerging and re-emerging diseases uh, is actually very much linked to something which is dear to me. And uh, what you do is really the, the, the one health issue that we have here to deal with zoonotic diseases. And that means that we are actually not just actually uh, uh, can say it's why we have SARS, SARS-1, SARS-2, MERS, and then the thing is over, but the potential all over is, act, is, is large and that we have to have a spirit of surveillance in order to really detect what is coming for us. And also this surveillance spirit is important in our strategies to fight the pandemic now. And I think this comes in particularly, as you know, there are from 1,400 pathogens, 800 around across the animal human barrier. But more important is what you know very well is that we have um, always not just a neglected disease, an emerging disease, we always have, and that's particularly clear uh, in, 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 uh, in many settings nowadays, <coughs> it's the triangle. <coughs> the tripod of neglected diseases, neglected people, but also neglected health and social systems. You see, when we are now wanting to, to have a strategy of control, then actually we, we very often see what we have to control, but we don't have the systems to carry that through. So these are basic uh, slides that uh, uh, you mostly know, but I just wanted to remind you that because this is important when people discuss strategy. And the most important one is this basic slide that some of you who know me and uh, uh, have seen it before, that is actually to understand if we come from an efficacious tool to an effective community action or a health systems action. And it is this famous cascade, downhill cascade, that we actually have here an efficacy of a tool let's say an efficacy of, um, uh, sorry, of, um, of um, uh, drug, which is 80%, but actually what counts that you reach effectiveness in a community is that you need to ensure access, the blue, uh, the target that you need to know whom to target, you must have from the provider the compliance and from the consumer the adherence, these blue factors are health system factors, but they're also factors on how we collaborate together. So if you have also a very nice efficacy of 80%, if you do not reach here uh, 100%, if you are actually low in these health system factors, your effectiveness in this example collapses to 29%. If we do not effectively work together, we collapse the effectiveness and that's at the end what counts. And that's particularly important if you take interventions and tools like masks, if you take interventions like uh, uh, distancing, and if this is not 100% done, then you can imagine that uh, the if efficacy of a tool reduces then its effectiveness in a substantial way. So I think this is something which is very specific now but it's something to think about in all our health interventions when we not, uh, we, that we not only aim at the magic bullet, the, 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 the drug or the vaccine, but we also think what it means to carry this magic bullet to, uh, to the uh, communities concerned. And of course, if you have not 100% effectiveness, you ask the question, do we reach everybody? And that's particularly important in a, in, in, in a situation where you have a pandemic situation that you are not, that you are equitable. If you have 80% effectiveness, but the remaining 20% are actually the poorest people, the most neglected people, then you have not the high equity effectiveness. This is just now basics. And you say, now when, when does it come now? 
to SARS-2 uh, COVID-19, then actually it's now the moment. But this is the fundamental thinking about the strategies that apply for all the countries. And I know very well, for instance, your Kenya, being in Kenya at the, uh, 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 at the uh, Lake Victoria area, uh, this issue of just saying, you know, we, we have masks, we have distancing and things are fine. If we don't have the compliance and adherence, we are actually losing the effects. And this was actually seen in the first uh, wave in the CIA area very clearly before it was reinforced. This is how it started for us, for all of us. This is the, an old graph when we actually got these dramatic pictures of doubling times every two days in some countries, Spain, Iran, Ita Italy. We got the doubling times here in Central Europe, Canada, Australia. And then we had actually, uh, that was the very beginning when we didn't have any data a lot on <coughs> the uh, African situation. I show you this is just out of this situation. Many of the countries were totally, totally overwhelmed. And, uh, and particularly it's also true for our country. And it's very interesting then when science come in, science only came in after we had the lockdown. So the scientific task force to inform the government about how we would move in this difficult situation actually came only in force in the 1st of April that the government created a science task force to assist the federal council at the crisis team and the steering committee. But we had the lockdown already on the 16th of March. So until the political level realized, oh, basically we should also involve the scientists to inform us about the scientific basis, it took some time. And what we do as a scientific task force, and that's very important for many of the settings, we, are produ we produce policy briefs and situation analysis, and these are all public. So on this website, and I will give you uh, Hung on, or others uh, this presentation, and you can it can be distributed. We are actually, uh, all what we produce as scientists, and that's a very important point, is not only for the government, but it is for the public and for the whole world. Everybody can read our website where actually uh, these policy briefs are, basically in English, but also, of course, in our national languages. And what we do in addition as this task force, just to show you how we try to inform the government, is that we are actually have continuous input into calculating and projecting the effective reproduction rate, as well as the TTIQ, which uh, reads as tick. It's the tick. That means it's the uh, it's testing, it's testing, tracing the isolation and quarantine, the system that is partly based also on an app. And this is actually the scientific contribution to constantly inform, not for the whole country, but actually for the regions, the reproduction rate, as well as uh, the contact tracing situation. So it's these two elements that flow into the decision-making process. The measures are actually then decided in the social political discussion, not only by the scientists, but by the federal council, but the, uh, with community representatives and with, uh, uh, with also the uh, different uh, uh, private sector and all the peoples that are uh, then involved in our economic and social tissue. So clearly it is not that we say what has to be done, but we inform about options of things that could, and we sometimes are a little bit stronger by saying should be done. But we are not, we are actually making policy relevant statements and options to act, but we do not do policy prescription. As soon as you go into the field, and that's internationally uh, an important issue, you can see this always, if the science does not just makes policy relevant statements, but makes policy prescriptions, we run into problems of, of politics 
and then the people say science is no longer independent, the scientists are bought, are corrupt, or actually uh, 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 really only uh, have their own self-interest. So as you can see from this really summary, uh, we actually face with science to inform policy. Uh, we actually are walking a tightrope uh, between really these relevant statements, the scientific evidence, and the, uh, the, the policy prescription. So this is, I'm sorry, this is in French, but I think this, the scientists also have a duty and this is not only just that with is epidemiology, but also with social science, with economics, uh, uh, that we are not just saying, oh, we can actually, uh, we can kill Corona by just having a heavy caterpillar with a large ball that breaks all the transmissions. But then what remains at the end is a heap of a economy that is collapsed, a social tissue that is collapsed. So this is actually not to discuss in detail, that looks wild, but this actually is what we produce in the science is that for the country, but also for the different regions, we have this, uh, the, the solid uh, lila line is the reproduction rate, effective reproduction rate of transmission. And so we follow from the beginning over time, if the case reproduction rate is over one, and we know now that we have actually, uh, uh, we have, uh, we, we went down and it, it was a terrible situation that we have went into the second wave. And, and uh, this is something that was known to the politicians. And uh, there is something where science should, in my opinion, should have been stronger because here what happened in July, August, our reproduction rate was always above one but we had still lower case numbers, but it started to build up. And this is actually the period which is important that you have, if you have long period over, over with a reproduction rate that was over one, this would actually predict that you run into troubles as we did at the end of October and beginning of November. And I think this is something which uh, is not a justification or an excuse, but it shows that despite we had these measures of surveillance and projections in place, we were actually not able to bring in the evidence that if you have over a long period, a reproduction rate that stays over uh, one and accumulates not too many cases that so politically, social politically, people said, oh, we are in a low case situation, but this low case situation produced then uh, this difficult situation we have with the consequences of cases, hospitalization, as well as afterwards uh, death. Below, you see another issue, which we were often asked from the politics measures. You see here, it is, you don't see it very uh, clearly, but it just shows what actually was forbidden in within a short period. And it's, it's all clear to all of you as scientists, of old uh, of scientists, that you have a multi-causal situation. So when people then politicians ask, so what is more important, distancing or masks? Then you, of course, you cannot disentangle this if you have the measures uh, uh, brought in in the same way, combined with the, F, uh, the effectiveness issues that I showed you before. So we went up, but, uh, but this is, we went up and I, I want just to uh, add a few other important characteristics, which are also important for your country and for all the country. In, in SARS-2, uh, uh, Corona, uh, uh, we have one difficulty, and this is the heterogeneity. So here is our country, Switzerland, that the, uh, the more it's red or dark, uh, uh, the red, it's more, uh, has, you have a higher uh, proportion infected. And what you see, the whole of Switzerland is not in any, has, doesn't show an equal distribution. So we have a heterogeneity in space. <laughs> then we have a heterogeneity in age. As you know very well, the younger people, they can be infected, but they are not seriously sick. And there is only 
the uh, problem with those who have a comorbidities. So if you have to deal with a disease that has heterogeneity like this, measures on a national level become difficult. Because as you can imagine, if you say it's a big problem now in Switzerland, some people in the central part would say, what are you talking about? We have no hardly any cases. It's not our problem. So a general measures face a problem. Or if you say, everybody be careful. Some people say we are in full swing. We are not getting infected. It doesn't affect us more much. So no problem. And so the communication and the tailoring of, uh, of, uh, mes uh, of messages and measures is actually an absolutely crucial thing. And I think this is something where I can say we were failing. We were failing uh, 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 because we had too many general measures for a whole of a country, but we had less tailored communication. Also, we are in a, in a political situation that would help us. I mean, Switzerland, we have 26 cantons and health, education, is, a, is cantonal affairs. So we have a, a, a major decentralization uh, and you have also decentralization in Kenya, Tanzania. Decentralization is an important tool to tailor an intervention, whatever it is, to a, a given uh, setting. So despite these decentralization possibilities, we have uh, uh, not very well handled in our situation uh, to use decentralization to really go in a very targeted way where uh, uh, things happen. So now with, with the measures, I would say a few thoughts about the measures, not to saying which is right and wrong, but actually just on what we build on. And uh, the interesting thing in, in, in COVID was <coughs> that the past lies ahead of us. This old picture shows you, even before we had the germ theory, shows you Professor Semmelweis and who discovered that his students coming from the anatomy uh, uh, lessons, practicals, actually had uh, transmitted much more infection to uh, uh, women giving birth. And uh, the measure at that time, when we didn't know anything about bacteria in the mid 19th century, was that one said hand washing. So you see the hand washing thing was actually what came up as a first thing in the measures, not only in Switzerland, these were the posters, not from Semmelweis period, but from this spring where we said, do wash your hands. Uh, this is so we were actually going back to experience from before. But what I would like to do, uh, think about more about uh, cho uh, choosing measures and uh, uh, what were considerations. You see, the, the, basic, uh, the basic issue in measures is the question that they are feasible, that you can bring it into a population, acceptable, and it's also proportional that it is actually relative to other risks and measures, is it really um, uh, making, a, 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 is it justified to have one strict measure compared to uh, the, the living situation, the social tissue, the economic tissue? And of course, it is important that there are joint efforts and that there are actually uh, cross border issues. I mean, you had this in very clearly also in Kenya. I mean, we, we cannot just sit in a country, close up the country. New Zealand did it. New Zealand sitting on islands was actually just closing everything. And then they got actually through very, uh, very well. We in a country like Switzerland sit in the middle of Europe. We have to see what France, Germany, Austria and Italy do. Then came the question of the lockdown. The lockdown, the first lockdowns were done because we were overwhelmed and had to stop once to get a little bit quiet and to reflect. And we also know that lockdowns, severe lockdowns are okay to reflect, but then to open again. But if we repeat, then actually 
uh, it's uh, socially and economically fatal. If you go up and down into, into lockdowns and then you shut down economy, you shut down social life to a large extent, and then you come up again. And this is very important for the period right now and for the festive pe uh, period, people think of the so-called circuit break. The circuit breakers are just short, hard lockdowns of two to three weeks uh, or four weeks. And there the problem is that if you, if you do a circuit break now before Christmas and then you open everything again, you can still have the risk that you get into a new wave. This is the so-called yo-yo effect that many people know from diets. You actually do a diet, you lose weight. And if you don't do anything afterwards with your food behavior, you are actually back to your old weight very soon again. Of course, we have the outlooks for, um, uh, for um, uh, the vaccination, but if these major efforts are being completed, it still takes time. Even if now, like UK announced, that they would start vaccinating uh, this week or next week. Takes time. Then the last issue, which you as scientists are interested, is of course the herd immunity. And some of the countries chose a strategy uh, just to say, let's have the transmission going on. People get infected, they are afterwards immune and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, things are fine. The problem here in, in COVID are twofold. One, that the immunity to corona is not an immunity to measles, where you are once infected, once vaccinated, and you are safe for life. We know that the immunity to SARS-CoV-2 is uh, shorter lived, maybe half a year. And not everybody has, uh, uh, after exposure, a very good immune response. And we have the best immune response when you have been uh, ill and, and better even if you have been severely ill. And uh, actually then you get also a good amount of neutralizing antibodies. And then you have the other point, if you have solved the, the immunity side, you must solve that, uh, that you must protect as a society. You have the duty also to protect risk groups, not the ones who are in old people's home, but those who are actually risk groups that are uh, uh, having comorbidities, but are still actually in our social and economic life. So these are uh, some of the issues in general about measures. What we then did actually, and that's something that's a learning from previous situations uh, in, uh, in, in, in disease control, is that we actually, uh, of course, went, this is, you can say, the Swiss cheese model. Here is our virus. We have the different measures bringing together. We know that each measure has some holes in it, but if you bring measures together like distancing, washing hands, wearing masks, and early testing of symptomatic people, then you can actually protect your population. So with this picture, you should go back to my initial picture on the effectiveness, and then you realize that each of this decay of efficacy of each of the of the measures follows this law. And actually it's clear that you are a bit better off if you actually have a multi-layered situation. But still the question how you, uh, you prevent, and that's important, not just that you don't get the transmission through, but that you are detecting very early uh, transmission occurring. And so the backbone of the uh, Swiss, uh, approach, but also of uh, some of our neighbors, but less, was actually a learning that we had from working with neglected emerging and re-emerging diseases, that we actually have surveillance response. Some of you remember that uh, in WHO, when uh, we were actually having the uh, scientific advisory group to Tedros uh, on malaria elimination, which I had the privilege and pleasure to chair. I mean, one of the key messages was that we actually have to do surveillance response. That means that you actually not collect data in monitoring and evaluation mode, but you actually do surveillance 
and you collect data, minimal essential data in space and time in order to find out where transmission occurs and then you can give a tailored intervention. We have actually had a technical, uh, uh, a technical addition which helped a lot. This is the so-called Swiss COVID app for after the testing, you do the tracing and the, those who are infected are isolated and the main contacts are in quarantine. This actually, this TTIQ, this tick, you can do traditionally, but if you have an app, uh, this helps a lot. This app, and that's very interesting on this uh, technology. I mean, initially people said, we should just take an app from Singapore or from South Korea, but this will not work in our country because of the Data Protection Act, where we should actually not create a central database. And therefore the Swiss COVID app is totally free of having a central database. The, uh, the internet protocol on your computer is destroyed after 14 days. So it's really something that is just a help to be alerted when you have, have the contact with a positive person, but it is not, not a, 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 a control issue as you could see you had in, the, uh, in South Korea, Singapore, but also in Israel and so on. So this, there we lost time to develop it because we had to follow our, our laws. But what we remain with is really surveillance response, detect early, see the picture below where a fire starts so that you can go there and act. And this is possible if you have the decentralization, you do this in the cantons, in, in the districts in your situation, and you actually have a public health response package tailored to the transmission setting. If you have to uh, uh, have a, 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 if transmission starts in a party, a parlor, if transmission starts in a choir of a church, if transmission is in an old people home, your, uh, your action is different, totally different. And so this surveillance response is a key issue because as long as you can no longer do the tracing and go early, then you run into a wave. And that's what happened now with the second wave that our contract tracing system was weak, processes were long, and therefore we run into uh, the wave that uh, you know very well as many other countries. But we have actually with this, and compared to say, for instance, countries with very hard lockdowns where you could only leave your house for one hour, for one kilometer uh, 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 situation, this did not bring a better control of the, of the pandemic, and, but it had a huge effect on the social tissue of the people. The key issue in, in surveillance response in this approach is communication. It's the tailored communication, and particularly because of what I said with this heterogeneity. You can imagine, and some of you remember when we had Ebola in 2014, Ebola uh, was much easier to communicate because from the baby to the grandfather, everybody who was infected had a risk of 50 to even 60% to die. This is a much easier issue to get the, the community understand the severity and, uh, and the community to engage in measures. In SARS with the heterogeneity, we, we don't have it. So therefore communication is key. And it comes back to this issue that I've told you before. It is really, if we want to be effective, the question of adequacy, appropriateness and acceptance is very important, are very important. And it is what we learned even if you have very nice TTIQ pre, uh, um, uh, processes of contact tracing with nice technology, it's the processes that count that we are actually in time, not only just transmitting by email, but also doing the analyze and act quickly. Otherwise, surveillance response does not work. And then surveillance response is like this picture. So we must through processes through sharing and well-definition of roles and responsibilities in a given ethical and legal framework, we must accelerate these processes. 
We must not have another new technology, another new technology. That's how we can make surveillance response work. There's something which comes up in all the countries now. It's really, and this is just a, an introductory slide to show what is basically necessary is really to look. We have in Switzerland, we did a stress study concerned about people long time in quarantine, uh, having lockdowns, having homeschooling and home office together, particularly in, in uh, poor uh, settings where six people are in two be bedroom ap apartments and have only two computers. That is actually the issue where stress comes up. And indeed, about during lockdown and afterwards, 50 to 40% had stress, and it's only 26%, 30% after lockdown that said, no, I'm fine, I'm in top shape. It's very interesting that those who didn't have stress during these times, they all said, I have more relaxations, I have less uh, obligations, and I can actually have less to do also for the schooling, so I'm fine. But more important for society is actually what those mention about stress. I mean, the burden through the uh, workplace changes to childcare changes for being alone for and, and the worrying about the future, the job, worrying about uh, uh, that you are actually don't have so much freedom anymore. That was very significant. And this study is now being uh, 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 brought, uh, uh, is continued because this is really the, the issue where science must contribute a lot on long-term effects, the mental health, as well as then the societal tissue, to what extent actually <coughs> the societal tissue is actually affected. So I think this is something which, uh, uh, when we talk about science and such a pandemic, uh, the lesson from this small slide here is, not just to concentrate on epidemiology and infection control, but also look at the, the, not just to do social science, but really do at the effects on well-being, on the social tissue, because it's the social tissue that carries the economic tissue and not the other way around. And I think this is a key area where science still uh, must contribute a lot. And I mean, talking to Ilri, you have actually there the issue that uh, you have all these populations uh, that are in a one health situation where one must optimally balance uh, really the well being of the society uh, uh, that is actually largely carried in the pastoralist uh, 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 groups by the well being also of, uh, the, uh, of, of the animals and the productivity of the animals. So this is an outlook where science still has a lot to do. Even if we have a vaccine, these longer term effects of this one year of a, a relatively dramatic situation that has touched the world has to be looked at because that will certainly determine on how we are actually uh, interacting together, not just traveling, but actually how uh, meaningful are uh, some of the relations and how meaningful or not meaningful are just to, to work in distance with Zooms and so on. Here, I mean, the outlook for vaccination is now good and you read also the, the journals. And I think just wanted to have summarized on one slide that this is all fine. And, uh, but we know that we still have, I mentioned it before on herd immunity, that we have the natural immunity, which is not as fantastic as in a case like, uh, like measles. The po positive thing is that we have nowadays, thanks to the work that we did in Ebola, thanks to the work that we did, for instance, in malaria, we have new ways of doing uh, uh, clinical studies, enrolling procedure, overlapping phases. This is actually what we have installed quite a lot through the work in, in uh, particularly Africa where we have actually learned how we can ethically correct, develop tools quicker than standard procedures. We have all these candidates, that's all very nice. Uh, we should not 
uh, be a bit careful about the intermediate results because they were only taken after a shorter period. And we really need to see that full phase three results are there because that determines registration, but also post-registration -regi -re condi uh, conditionalities. Also, these uh, preliminary results that are looking very well, we have to see uh, there is uh, immunity induced against infection and or disease or, and, and, and very important, how long does this go? The good thing again is that we have this iterative process with regulatory agencies to, uh, to, to, to go on and accelerate registration. But on the other hand, each country will have a huge challenge where also science can help is really to have the whole supply chain, the supply chain management of such a major operation is not the easiest thing in the world. How do you set priorities for risk groups and in this case, health staff and their families? And, uh, and uh, uh, how is the communication again? So this is a slide to show that we are on good track, but we have to think about and uh, that we have really uh, to, to maintain, not just the, uh, to, to maintain the scientific standards, but also the ethical standards, because that, that determines acceptance in the, in, 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 the, in the communities. So we here, we have something to come. We could actually discuss a lot about these many discussions, which are really the ways of transmission and the roles of aerosols. We, we have the issue of the children here as a key sentence is that children are not the drivers of the epidemic. They can be infected, they can transmit, but they are not the drivers. You have all the discussion on what does, uh, what does actually the PCR test do and not do, and also which uh, rapid diagnostics tests are now being used, even using saliva, no longer the difficult uh, nose, throat uh, uh, swaps that you have to go through. Then the famous discussion on masks, where the difference is very often not made between masks as a barrier versus mask wearing behavior. Most of the risk with masks is how you wear it and how you keep it clean it, uh, then uh, it's the mask as such and the immune and the vaccines we discussed. This may be questions that will come up afterwards. But what we have learned in academics and also with the discussion with the, the politician is actually what I want to come back. Is here the title, we must be humble we must say that we are scientists. We show what we know and what we don't know, but we must also be pragmatic. And this goes back to this scientist here you saw at the beginning who is looking and studying. And here, when, when I see such a scientist and coming out of this crisis, I would say, remember, my dear friends, always the sentence that Sir Bradford Hill made in the time when... Uh, Sir Bradford Hill was um, discovering uh, the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Initially, people said, ah, oh, you need more studies, you need more studies, you need more studies before you can say uh, this is uh, real, uh, something that is connected. And uh, many of you have written in your thesis the sentence, uh, this problem warrants more research. When I saw this with a student, I said, you can write this and I agree, but if you don't know what the more research is, if you are not able to re formulate the research question, you better should not write this sentence. So what does this mean for public health and for uh, the link with the politicians is actually what Bradford Hill said in this nice long sentence, but it basically says, the science does not know all at once, but this does not mean that we are not doing anything in public health. Even if you don't know all and you have to do more studies, you know enough to already do something. And I think this is one of the key issues in the dialogue between the scientists and the politicians. It's always to say what you know and what you don't know, but also what with what you know and what you don't know, 
already can be done for the benefit of the population, for benefit of a country in order to move. And this is not just a scientific issue, that's also an ethical issue. So I like very much this sentence because this has guided me through uh, four decades of research uh, 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 throughout. And I'm uh, uh, very happy that I had the privilege, particularly also through collaboration and particularly through collaboration and partnership with Africa to learn these issues on how one actually generates scientific evidence and one can translate it into, into a public health action. And you have certainly now seen that the road to success uh, has no shortcuts. This is this driver saw this as well. And uh, I would say the, what, the, what the thing is, please don't give up. Let's be committed. We are sitting in one boat, as our colleague says, don't give up. And I thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Max, then, uh, for this uh, beautiful and excellent talk. Uh, There's a lot of uh, take home message from the talk, you know, going really from the deep science into the policy and also the reflection of the public health career applied for this uh, particular pandemic at the moment. Uh, so uh, a very rich talk and, uh, you know, I look at the time, thank you very much for you and I feel so that now you are, uh, you know, I hope that you are okay, uh, because I feel a little bit sense in the voice, but you talk with people in Nairobi, but also uh, our colleagues in different countries, including Ethiopia, uh, Vietnam, but even, you know, our colleague is still sitting in Switzerland. Uh, for that. So uh, time is uh, uh, almost up, but uh, we, during the, you talk, you know, uh, our colleague put a lot of questions and the question has been kind of answered with the long of the talk. So, so some of these things was clarified, but here I would like just to take one or two questions uh, from the group. And uh, our uh, colleague Eric Ferrer uh, asked you, I think that is quite two interesting questions and I read two and you can, you know, give some element of uh, answer if, if, if you like. Uh, Mark said, my question is about the role of science and policy making. There has been a lot of confusion and disagreement in the science community on how to manage COVID-19. How should scientists help prepare politicians to respond? So that is the first one. But I link also to the second uh, question, maybe it's dear to you because uh, of Switzerland. Uh, the question is about uh, shutting down the economy. Europe is about to have a big fight over whether to open ski resorts in Switzerland or other country versus allowing that important sector of the economy to continue working. Uh, so in Kenya, for example, there are arguments over opening bars and churches. It is making people uh, you know, mad and politicians also nervous. So how can science be convincing on this? Thank you, Marcel. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Hung. I mean, I still have um, the time and I've seen these questions also in the chat. I was reading that one. Now, uh, to this first question, uh, the great parenting uh, declaration and so on. I think the point is that the scientists should, as I tried to say at the beginning, always make scientific relevant statements based on the evidence they put together. And I think uh, this is, is the key issue. As soon as you're making with a declaration, basically a prescription, you run into, into a discussion that is not helpful because in a crisis situation, it is important to work together and not to say, I believe this, I think this. And I think this is something where uh, away from COVID, I, in my work in the academies, I, it's my biggest problem to, in also other uh, topic like, uh, gene technology in issues like biodiversity, climate, energy is really to find this interface between what do we know as scientists and what uh, actually are uh, 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 options to act, and, but not prescriptions to act. And I think this is the, the that is the first part of the question. I think that we remain uh, there. So I, if uh, if uh, if a, a great Barrington declaration is, is written in a way where you take all the evidence together and you scrutinize this evidence, be it meta-analysis and other procedures on how we do comparative analysis of what we know and we don't know, then this is fine. 
all these issues become difficult when scientists become uh, leaders of a, a group of beliefs, because then we are back to uh, more uh, touchy religious issues. And you know, mankind has not profited a lot from uh, re religious wars over a thousand years and more. So this is the point. Now, the skiing resort issue is a very good discussion. It's not because of skiing and Switzerland. It's because a typical example of where uh, 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 one must reconcile the issue. You know, skiing as such is not a problem. You never get infected while skiing. The problem is where actually when you are going in your cable cars or when you are going in the evening when it's cold, into a small hut in the mountains and so on. That's where your transmission can occur. So the scientist must only state, that's the scientific statement. And it uh, is, is to say what matters is distance, what matters is hygiene, what matters is contact. If we need to go out of this situation that we are now, we need to bring case numbers down. We should see how we can avoid uh, these, um, these, these multiple contacts, also contacts across the different, um, um, the different um, bubbles where people interact. That's why we have restrictions that you can only meet uh, 10 people out of two bubbles, maybe two families and so on. And I think this is something which is there. The scientists should not say, let this skiing resort in the eastern part open and you, uh, uh, in the central part not, but actually really only say, this is what we know as scientists, what favors transmission. So for the inside rooms, it's also the aerosols, the non-aerated places of bars and discos and so on. And actually this is what we state, but we don't say close it now. That is actually after the social political discussion where also the economic considerations come in and Switzerland has now a, a policy, for instance, that we want to keep certain social life. We are not like uh, uh, other neighboring countries where they say we make a hard lockdown. We want to keep some economy and therefore also social life going. And we keep the schools open in order to allow this. But the, uh, in these situations, one must really respect these basic measures. The problem is, that everybody understands that and is basically happy. But once they are uh, in the situation and once the restaurants are open, uh, people are getting less uh, care, uh, careful. This doesn't mean they don't respect. But as you could see from my very, so the second, the third slide on effectiveness, if you are only doing things half, two thirds, it has already a huge impact on effectiveness. And this is actually the biggest problem. That's why my point also communication and not propaganda communication in order to keep compliance and adherence high. And this is, uh, that's the key thing. Today at two o'clock, our federal council will actually decide how they want to handle ski resorts and Christmas. And we were actually advising exactly in this way saying, you can basically always find a concept that works, but it is it is afterwards the big issue, and this is also a scientific issue, communication science, how you can maintain high degrees of adherence and compliance. Very and there good. Is just, uh, just another point which comes in is the rapid uh, uh, test, uh, briefly, uh, I mean, the rapid test question. Of course, these rapid tests, and particularly the ones now, on with saliva, if well validated, have an important point because they can, it's not that they replace all the tests, but it can be used, for instance, if somebody wants uh, uh, to travel or wants to visit also people in an old people's home, you can do a rapid test because we know they have a very good specificity, have a lower sensitivity, but if you are positive in these rapid tests, you are infectious. So you can bring this into your control strategy in a very effective way. And even with the vaccine, we, we, are not, uh, we are not then free and can forget about tests. So if you see these rapid tests now coming, plus the vaccine coming, we will have some more tools 
tools for an integrated control. Over. Okay, thank you very much, Max. And actually, you are reading also the message, and actually, very nice that you brought this uh, uh, rapid test. Time is almost up, but you know, Max, and maybe I, I take the liberty because I have the microphone now to ask a short question, and I want you to tell us only in one minute, maybe. You always talked about mutual uh, mutual learning for change among us in research partnership, and now for this COVID context, you see example of Vietnam where I come from, and I've, sometimes I'm proud of that. We control COVID quite well with China. So, and you know, that's kind of low, you know, in middle income countries. And when you look at Europe and North America, the situation is uh, much more, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very a drastic increase on this thing. So, so what, what is your short comment on the, you know, mutual learning for chain, which in these two contexts, how, how we can learn from you and how some of this, you know, heavily hit by COVID-19 can learn a bit from from some countries they have, you know, they have a better control in the sense of number of cases and number of deaths at the moment where I refer to Vietnam and China. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it, it is an important discussion and I think it's actually, we, we looked a lot about uh, the uh, Southeast Asian uh, situation. And here, as I tried to mention briefly with the, with the app, I mean, it would have been an easy thing and we would have done better if we would have just taken the South Korean and the uh, Chinese app uh, systems. But this actually leads to a situation uh, uh, home, uh, where uh, we are not being capable to introduce that in the population. The biggest hesitation is also, uh, Birgit Habermann asks uh, similar questions. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the situation is that we are uh, having we are people are suspicious to have a central database and to be controlled. Also, Israel uh, we did very well at the beginning, and in Israel, you they just had to switch over the contact tracing uh, to the uh, secret service system, and they could actually have each smartphone in the whole of Israel and in the occupied territories locked. And this is something which was not. Uh, <laughs> accepted. So we, the learning was that we needed such apps. The learning was also that it could not be transferred immediately. And we, we, we had it to detach in the case of the Swiss COVID app it from a, a, a GPS based link so that people were, could not be linked where they are. And uh, actually it had to be uh, delinked from a central database. And so it was a learning in, 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 in a situation, but it is also comes acceptance and feasibility in a given social political uh, system. And that's very important. So the same thing is when uh, Birgit in the same context asked about um, the ample system, that the traffic light system, I mean, a traffic light system for a whole of a country is basically not possible with the heterogeneities we have. Because if you would do this, then some parts of the country would say, for us, it's green, it's not red. And, and if you want to, to do this by, by canton or by district, it becomes very complex to have really real-time information and not creating also systems that a situation that we had. We had uh, in Geneva, we had a lot of cases. As a consequence, peop, uh, they, they, they closed the bars and restaurants and everything. What happens, they went to the neighboring uh, canton and they had their, the big parties and so on. And then as a consequence, these cantons run into a much quicker second wave. So having this ample system or this traffic light system is, 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 is a tricky issue. And particularly if you are close together, of course, nobody, if you close the bars in Kenya, uh, in Nairobi, will then run to Mombasa uh, for a party. But I mean, it's, it's a different situation if you are, 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 are very close. So this, this adaptation to the local setting is in these situations absolutely important. Thank you very much. That is very nice comment and, and input from you. Uh, Mark said uh, time is up, uh, but uh, I would like to say that it was really a big privilege to have you uh, uh, today with our uh, INRI staff. And, uh, Thank you very much for the uh, contribution and, and sharing, and I wish you all the best, and we hope that you know, we keep uh, this uh, contact going on. And I take this opportunity to thank you, Hugh, very much for the past support to our partnership, INRI and Sweetie Page.
Thank you very much, Marcel. Thank you, all, everybody. Thank you very much. I will send Hung the slides and then he can then distribute it uh, to all. Uh, this, these are open and free for everybody. And, and uh, without any doubt, I mean, uh, we will continue our partnership. And I, st I still remember the time when I was at Ilri, when it was still Ilrat. And I, I, I now see where you are. And I, I have followed your, your part uh, from actually 1976 onwards, when I was working with Hiro Hirumi on the cultivation of the cultivation of the bloodstream forms of uh, trypanosomes. That was actually part of my PhD thesis in 1977. So, I mean, I, I'm very much linked to all of you and I admire the work you do. And we Pila Shaka, we Tuna Indalea Pamocha, Asante Nisana. Thank you very much, dear friends.